All right, thank you guys so much for being here. This is our second to last session for the UDL series. So we're really excited for you to be here. I wanna thank our hub team who's helped put together this series. This includes Maggie Beckin from DCB, Jordan Bentz, Molly McKinnon, and Mark Coppin from NDSU, and our team here at Minot State University, which is myself, Jessica Reiswig, uh, Luke Charlie, Kyle Erickson, and Jody Patchen. So we're gonna go ahead and turn it over to Luis so that we can make sure that we have enough time for today's content. So go ahead and take it away. Let me uh, go ahead and stop the music and then we'll go ahead and get started. And uh, actually Mark Coppin and, and myself, we go back a little bit, more than a decade of knowing each other. So it's exciting to know that he's part of uh, putting this program together. All right, so welcome everybody uh, to this session, which I've titled Essential for Some, Helpful for All, uh, thinking about universal design for learning. And I understand you have a little bit of background. So my goal is maybe some of this will be a little bit of review. Some of it may be a different take on some of the ideas that you've heard about. And so I welcome your feedback. I can not see the chat. I welcome your feedback and your thoughts um, as we go through the presentation. Uh, you can access the slides. Uh, it's an accessibility best practice. Um, I've created a short link. I'm gonna drop that into the chat in just one minute. So it is a bit.ly or short URL, and I'll read it out loud as well. bit.ly UDL echo ECHO 360. So give that a shot. Hopefully it would it will work for you, but that's so that you can follow along with the slides um, with your preferences on your device. Uh, you can also use a QR code. I have a QR code up on the screen. So that's another way you can get access to the slides. Uh, and I've done my best to make those slides as accessible as possible by doing both uh, automated and a manual check for accessibility. All right, so I am part of uh, CAST, and CAST is the organization that developed the Universal Design for Learning Principles. And it's hard to believe, but it's been four decades since CAST got started. And we're actually celebrating 40 years of existence next year with a big celebration next summer. And so our mission, um, I'm part of a group at CAS that looks at uh, UDL in post-secondary and workforce uh, settings. And our mission for our group is that we believe that learning is a lifelong practice. It doesn't end when you leave formal schooling. It continues throughout your life. And even more so now, right? We live in a world that is uh, experiencing rapid change, especially with new te developments with technology, with AI. And so lifelong learning is just something that we all need to incorporate into our lives. And we also believe that every learner should have access to and belong in education and training environments that are designed with their needs and preferences in mind. Too often we just focus on the needs, but the preferences are just as important because when your preferences are respected, you feel more included, you feel like you belong, and it has an impact on your engagement. So not just needs, but also preferences. So a little bit about me, um, I identify as a disabled person. I use identity first language, um, and sometimes I use it interchangeably with person first language. So. Identity first is disabled person. Uh, person first language is person with a disability. And that just reflects my lived experience as someone uh, who's lived for almost my whole life with an identified and diagnosed disability. So that disability, it's not everything that I am, but it's a big part of who I am. And it really uh, sort of shapes the way that I look at the world and my perspective on the world. So I do have a... Uh, TED-Ed talk that's available on the TED-Ed website, and it really speaks to my experience with disability. Um, I have a condition known as retinitis pigmentosa, which means I have um, almost no peripheral vision. So you can actually simulate what it's like to have retinitis pigmentosa. If you hold up your hands and you make two small circles and then look at the world through those two small circles, that's what retinitis pigmentosa, it's kind of a, a, a crude simulation, but that's what it's like. So it makes navigating the uh, physical environment, it makes navigating the digital environment uh, somewhat difficult. 
but I've been a big beneficiary of accessibility. I've been a big beneficiary of universal design for learning. And that really drives my passion for this work. And, and so um, I'm gonna play a little bit of that presentation right now. If, I, if everything works out okay, give me one second while I bring that up here. And I'm just gonna play uh, a few minutes from that presentation so that you get to know my experience a little bit. And we should have the captions turned on here. So here we go. Vision. Now, having written Ice Pigmentosa can actually come in handy sometimes. Right now would be one of those times. <laughs> but you know, having written Ice Pigmentosa, it's not just about what's happening to my eyes. It's about a lived experience. And so I want to share that experience with you, but in a slightly different way. I want to share with you a poem that I wrote called Entre or Between. Oh, oh my gosh! Neither here nor there, neither blind nor sighted. I see you, but not all of you. You see me, but not all of me. Ni aquí, ni allá. The islands, the city, the country. Espanol, Spanglish, English. Y hoy quien soy, I quien sabe. So I learned to live in between, in and out of the shadows. And as the light turns to dark, and the darkness comes to life, I've learned to just dance, just dance in those shadows. What this poem is about, is about my experience as a person that lives between and betwixt. As a person with a visual impairment, I'm neither fully sighted nor fully blind. I live between worlds. As an immigrant from the Dominican Republic, as a person of color, I also live between worlds. Now, schools often want to assign us to a category. They want to give us a label. How much richer would education be if we recognize that every learner is unique and has a complex identity that we should celebrate and incorporate into learning. Now, today I'm very comfortable in my own skin as a person with a disability, but that wasn't always the case. When I was first diagnosed with my visual impairment, I actually went into a long depression, what I consider the darkest days of my life. So how was it that I was able to step out of the shadows and turn to the light? Well, there are a few things that helped me. The first, of course, was family, especially my daughter. She's the reason why I'm here today. Wanting to be there for her, wanting to be a good role model, encouraged me to get help. And she's made me a better person. When I was first diagnosed with my visual impairment, I wasn't sure if I would get to see that day. But just this spring, I was able to see her graduate from high school. And not too long ago, I got to move her into the dorm for her first year of college. <laughs> and as a person of Dominican-Filipino descent, she also lives between worlds. And I've wanted to be a good role model for her in that area of her life as well. The other thing that helped me step out of the shadows and turn to the light. I'm going to pause it there. That just gives you a little bit of a flavor of why I do the work that I do. I really believe we all live uh, intersectional identities. Um, we are much more complex than a single label can capture. And that really drives my work as an advocate for universal design for learning. Uh, so you can find that. It's, it's on my website, luispettisonline.com. Uh, you will find um, the rest of that presentation where I also talk about the role technology has played in allowing me uh, to really live a full experience in terms of my schooling and my work. And look at that, my good friend Mark Coppin showed up in the chat. So Mark has been a big part of that journey as well. So I'm just so happy to see him here and to see these connections. So here's what I hope to do today. You, you already have a lot of background on universal design for learning, but I'll share my definition um, as well, because I think it's important to make sure that we're all speaking the same language and are using um, you know, a clear definition, it really informs the work uh, nicely. And then I'll share just three big ideas, which may be a little bit of review, but hopefully will bring things together uh, in, in a nice way 
And then uh, finally, I'm going to turn it over to the Echo team here, who's going to introduce a case. And um, hopefully that will get you started with some UDL considerations as well. All right, so let me go back uh, to the video and see if there's anything that resonated with you. What resonated with you from the video? What stood out? What spoke to you? So I want this to be as uh, much of a conversation as possible. So feel free to use the chat. I don't know if you have the ability to unmute yourself, but if you want to unmute yourself, feel free to do that as well. And hopefully you're taking advantage of the captions if we have those available using the CC button. So I'll pause here and see what's resonating with you from the video. I'll share. Please, go ahead. Hello, everyone. My name is Sareli. And uh, well, the, the poem that was in uh, the talk resonated. Um, I am... Um, someone who exists in the in-betweenness and those words reminded me of the concept of Nepantla uh, which the Mexica and the Chicano movement have uh, used to to describe their social location within their cultural political um, mm -hmm. uh, and and practices within with their existence out here in the diaspora uh, so that that resonated the in-betweenness I also have um, uh, uh, unseen disabilities mm -hmm. and exist in between the hearing and the uh, the not hearing world. Uh, so I do take advantage of the captions and the transcripts when available. Um, so, Thank gracias for that. Thank you, gracias. Thank you for sharing that. And the way that I put it is we are all Venn diagrams. We're not check boxes, we're Venn diagrams, right? And we have these rich intersections. I, I'm a big believer in intersectionality. Uh, that concept's really powerful and for everybody. So that includes people of color and that includes people in other groups. Um, we all live intersectional uh, perspectives in the world. And I see a big comment here, which again, I am visually impaired. So one of you may have to summarize that one for me. Sorry, that's just mine. Um, this is Zarmas. I'm from DCB here in Botno. Um, I was just saying that I agree that I think that um, sometimes what I got from the video is sometimes we think short term in terms of like the training and the efforts that we put forth, like, oh, how can I use UDL to like help in my class for the spring or how can I help um, prepare myself for a course design or a redesign but we fail to kind of like consider how this has longer lasting impressions and um, impacts on our students and I feel like sometimes we can um, we should acknowledge that that classroom environment and those and I don't even think it's like an accommodation. I think it's a consideration, like a, considering the way that everybody is unique and the, the cultural experiences and the educational experiences we bring to the classrooms are so unique that it really is just about having consideration for other learners. And I think that we sometimes don't think about the lasting impact that that can have like on our students, that it's not just a semester, but it really could be, um, you know, opening and broadening their horizons for like, more learning or, you know, making them feel empowered in their capabilities in the classroom, or um, perhaps it's something that they never felt comfortable in school, and then suddenly they feel seen. And I think that that for me as an educator, that's the most important thing. Like, I'm here to teach my students about like history and stuff, but I also want them to feel seen and to feel heard and to uh, mm -hmm. find a voice, you know, that I think will help them be better citizens and just people in general and so I think that we need to think about this concept as like how do we make better humans <laughs> by just like uh, learning uh, to be considerate in the classroom and with our kind of pedagogy I think it's so important so I'm that's right kind there of with you I, I don't yeah. know if you can see my heart yes <laughs> I'm right there with you new, new zoom feature if you make certain gestures it <laughs> plays certain effects <laughs> 
So I love what you just said. Like, uh, by the way, uh, just to emphasize, often people think about universal design for learning and right away they go to people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So let's not forget what the ultimate goal is with UDL is to prepare expert learners. Right. And we're rethinking that term, expert learning learners, and trying to think with something different because we're updating the UDL guidelines right now. There should be an update release uh, next summer for our 40th anniversary. But the idea of expert learner, the intent is that um, you've mastered or you're proficient at the art of learning, right? So you're highly motivated, you know how to learn, uh, you have strategies for learning that you apply in a sort of strategic way. And that's what prepares you, like you said, beyond this semester, beyond mm -hmm. this school year. That's what prepares you for adapting to the challenges that life will bring. Most of us are not going to have one career, right? Mm -hmm. That's just those days don't exist anymore. Most of us are going to have multiple careers or uh, the same career, but in different ways because the world is changing around us. And so I just want to leave that as a thought um, as we go forward here, that that's the ultimate goal. It's to create lifelong expert learners that are able to adapt. And like you said, that are, you know, they bring their full selves to learning. And in order for you to bring your full self to learning, you have to be seen. Your full self needs to be seen. So that's really what that poem is about. So thank you for sharing that. So let me uh, just share again, I, I'm really big on reflection. It feels especially reflective today after playing that video. But I just want to know, what do you already know about UDL? So in the chat, can you share a word, a phrase, or an entire sentence? If you were to summarize UDL in a word, a phrase, or an entire sentence, what would you say? And I'm employing a UDL practice here. I'm activating your prior knowledge, your background knowledge. So Jessica says, making education accessible for all. I'll try to read as many of these as I can. Um, Doug says, everyone learns together. Amy says, inclusive. Vanessa Me uh, Robic says, multiple means of representation. Keep those coming. Let me see. Maybe I can use one of these gestures here. Let's see. If there we go. Fireworks. Whenever I hear multiple means, it activates the fireworks. Accessibility, of course, if you say accessibility, that that really makes me happy and warms my heart. <laughs> so I'm a big believer in accessibility as a foundational component of UDL. Multiple modes, so lots of great ideas coming through. Thank you so much, everybody. All right, so here's what I thought I would do. Um, I would start with this definition of UDL, and then I'm gonna share UDL in three big ideas. And hopefully that summarizes a lot of your learning and highlights some of the big ideas, which is also a UDL guideline. So here's the definition that we use at CAS. Uh, universal design for learning is an approach to improve and optimize teaching and learning for all. I'm going to highlight some terms here. For all, by setting clear and rigorous goals, anticipating barriers that some learners may face in accomplishing those goals, and then proactively designing to minimize those barriers. So key words here, anticipating barriers. We're always looking at the environment. There's always going to be a barrier to someone, right? And, and we'll talk about that in just a minute, why that is. So we want to make sure that we create flexible learning environments where there are some options and so that you can find what works best for you. And then being proactive. Right, So we anticipate that there are going to be barriers, and so we proactively design flexible solutions to address that. And it's about keeping up the rigor. And part of that is when we set clear goals and we provide options, we actually have a more accurate measure of what people know. And we allow to uh, for people to have that deeper learning that's um, essential when we remove those unnecessary barriers to learning. So what we want is a productive struggle, right? Where the content is challenging, but we've removed the unnecessary barriers so you can really focus on that deeper learning and keep up that rigor. So that's a lot. So I'm gonna break that down with just three big ideas. How do we make this happen? So here we go, UDL and three big ideas. The first one, the barriers in the environment and not in learners. And I have a graphic that goes along with that, which I'll describe. 
So the graphic is um, it comes from Alexander Denheiser, and it has a quote: "When a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower." And we have two scenes here. We have a winter scene, maybe very common in North Dakota. <laughs> We have a little flower, it's in the middle of winter, and it's not quite flourishing yet. And we see a snowman in the background to let us know that it's winter. But then spring comes along, and all of a sudden that flower has, or plant has the nutrients that it needs, and it has the rain, and it has plenty of sunlight, and now it can bloom. And so that's what we want to do with universal design for learning, is we want to set the conditions for optimal learning by removing those barriers which are in the environment and not in learners. And as I go along here, feel free to use the chat and just um, share what's resonating with you or what thoughts you have about each of these big ideas. Here's idea number two. Variability is the rule, not the exception. And a way to remember that is if you hold up your fingerprint, every learner's brain is as unique as their fingerprints. And so again, one, one size fits all solution is actually one size fits none because there is no average learner. And we've known that for a long time based on a lot of research uh, in the learning sciences. So what we say instead is that every learner has what we call a jagged learning profile. And the jaggedness comes from, if you were to sort of measure a number of dimensions that each of us has in terms of learning, things like memory, language, reading ability, vocabulary, curiosity, and so on. If we were to chart those things, they would be high in some areas, they would be lower in some areas. And so as we plot that, we get what we call a jagged learning profile. So to address that variability, again, we need to provide options so that people find those options that work best for them. And we know that people vary in terms of three different dimensions. What engages you in learning, how you take in information for learning and how you act upon the world and how you navigate the learning environment. And those three dimensions really correspond to different parts of the brain. The central part of the brain for engagement, the back part of the brain for representation and the front part of the brain for action and expression. And the tool that we have to really address that variability and to address barriers is the UDL guidelines. And so this is available on the CAST website. You can go to udlguidelines.cast.org. We're going to be updating them next year. Uh, the general structure, which I'll discuss now, is going to be fairly similar in the new update. But what we want to do is incorporate more of that intersectionality, uh, include more representative research from voices that we haven't heard in the research before. Um, uh, also focus on identity and the role that identity plays in learning and the social dimensions of learning a little bit more and how we build knowledge in different ways in different societies. So some societies are more individualistic in terms of how we create knowledge. Some are more communal, right? And they use storytelling. They use different methods to pass down traditions and pass down um, the story of the community. So we want to address those uh, gaps, if you will. And the UDL guidelines is meant to be a living document, and it's meant to be updated every few years because it should reflect what we know about the learning brain, which is improving all the time. And it should also reflect our world and the context in which learning takes place. So look for that update um, next summer. So here's the, the general outline or structure of the UDL guidelines. It's a grid, and it goes from left to right. It corresponds to the three principles multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representation, and multiple means of action and expression. You're motivated to learn, you take in the information, and then you demonstrate your understanding of it, right? So usually you have some sort of assessment. But we also like to highlight the layers of the UDL guidelines from top to bottom. There's the access layer. And the access layer corresponds to the things that we do to ensure that the learning environment is accessible, and that people feel safe and they feel welcome. And so that's foundational. If you don't have that, right? Uh, one of our founders at CAS, Skip Stahl, says, if you can't reach them, you can't teach them. So you have to be able to take in that information. You have to be able to perceive it. We have to get your attention and you know, recruit your interest. 
And you have to be able to get to that information. So you need to be able to navigate the learning environment. So these are sort of foundational uh, aspects of learning. Then there's the build um, layer. And here the goal is to build learning skills so that we're taking accessible information and we're making it meaningful to ourselves. And so the goal with UDL is not just to make information accessible. That's just the starting point. It's to give you the tools that you can take accessible information and make useful knowledge out of it. Uh, our founder, David Rose, one of the things that really impressed me, um, I, one of the first times that I saw him speak at a conference, uh, he said, we don't want to provide access to boredom. So if we do, you know, take all these steps to make learning accessible, but it doesn't matter to you, what's the point? <laughs> so I always tell people, how are you giving learners m &Ms? And by that, I don't mean the candies because we don't want everybody to get diabetes. What I mean is you need to make it matter and you need to make it meaningful. So it has to be relevant to you. So how are you providing those m &Ms in your learning design? And then the final layer is that internalized layer. And here we're building self-understanding and internalizing learning behaviors. So now you've really taken ownership of learning and you're self-directed, right? But you're also self-aware in the sense that you know what works best for you and you can advocate for it. And that's so essential to build these skills as people move through our learning system, right? From K-12 to higher education to the workforce. To be able to understand yourself and be able to explain what you need and what you prefer to learn at your best, that's a really essential skill. And then, of course, at the bottom, we have the ultimate goal, which is to develop, um, you know, we say expert learner for me because I'm a political science person. That's my background. Um, to me, it's to develop a citizen learner. So a well-informed citizen who's able to, you know, exercise their rights and responsibilities in society and do that through the, you know, management of information and the management of participation in their society and their democracy. For me, that's the goal, is to create a citizen learner who has an impact on the world. So that's how I define expert learner. How do you define expert learner? So let me hear from you. You've heard a lot from me. I'm okay with awkward silence too. <laughs> So what does expert learning mean to you? Um, so in my field, I teach in the social sciences. So I do like history, art history, um, women and gender studies. For me, it's really about um, making sure that my students are processing information and that they're able to find sources, but then find um important ways of transmitting that information after they've processed it. So it's about like critical thinking. And then it's about being able to find the most appropriate way for them to express what they think about that. Because I feel basically that we have, we're being bombarded with like opinions and opinions and opinions now with this like 24 hour news cycle that I think that sometimes when I'm in class and I ask questions, a lot of them are just like, I don't know, I don't care, nobody, I don't know. And and I tell them, no, you do know, and I'm sure you do think something about this, but if you haven't had the opportunity to formulate a thought or develop a kind of um, cohesive understanding of whatever topic is mm -hmm. really relevant, then you haven't exercised that, that right? And so, we're at a small like two year and these students are going to go on to like a four year or grad school. And I want them to feel confident in their ability to like communicate and to express thoughts and then like have those grounded in um, whatever fact based information that they can find. So for me, an expert learner is like recognizing that you don't know everything, but then also kind of like being confident and comfortable in expressing yourself um, with the information that you do have. So I think that mm -hmm. that's what works or what I'm trying to kind of like promote. Humility is, if I hear you correctly, humility with uh, curiosity, 
being humble enough to say, I don't know all the answers, but you know what? I'm going to find a way. I'm going to find some some more information, some more insight. I'm going to reach out to people and I'm going to continuously be curious. Um, I think that's something from Ted Lasso, I think. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's ringing in my head, like be humble, right? And, and at the same time, be curious. I don't know. It's been a while since I watched it. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. And again, any of you are free, welcome to share in the way that makes the most sense for you. If you want to use the chat or if you want to come over the microphone. So two big ideas, right? The bears are in the environment, not in learners. And variability is the norm. Here's the final one. No surprise here. Accessibility is foundational. You cannot have UDL without accessibility. And I want to see uh, how you define accessibility. I want to make sure we're all on the same page. So if you were to get in an elevator and somebody were to ask you, what is accessibility? How would you respond? There's lots of ways that people think about accessibility, and we want to make sure that we're all speaking the same language. We're clarifying vocabulary in case you're interested in the relevant UDL <laughs> guideline here in Checkpoint. What is accessibility? And you can, again, use a word, a phrase, a sentence, any of those work. Amy says, removing barriers to accessing information. Krista says, clarifying language is a huge piece in my classes, and I appreciate it. Absolutely. Let me see. I'm practicing these gestures. Let's see if this one works. It's supposed to do something if I hold out. Maybe. There we go. Balloons. You get some balloons. <laughs> Anybody else? Let me try another one. Hold on. This was my favorite, I think. Should do confetti. There you go. All right. So I will share a definition, just one definition. This is one that we often share, but I'm going to modify it slightly. Uh, this is the definition that comes to us from the U.S. Department of Education and their Office for Civil Rights. Um, accessibility is when a person with a disability can do three things. And hopefully these three things sound familiar to you. Acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, and enjoy the same services as a person without a disability. I don't know. Hopefully I, some things are coming together for you here. Three things. I feel like Steve Jobs and the iPhone can do three things, but... Three things here, right? They align very nicely with the UDL principles, right? If we want everybody to acquire the same information, we need to provide multiple means of representation. If we want everybody to be able to engage in the same interactions, we need to provide multiple means of action and expression. And if we want everyone to enjoy the same services or have an enjoyable experience, we need to provide multiple means of engagement. And there's some um, sort of qualifiers here. We want that experience to be equally integrated and with substantially equivalent ease of use. So we don't want to build a uh, facility where people with disabilities come in through the back door. You know, where the deliveries get made or the trash gets taken out. We want to create one entrance, right? That everybody's able to come into the building um, at the same time. And then once they're inside the building, they're able to participate in what happens inside the building. So the only modification I would make to this definition is that I would change a person with a disability with everyone. Because with UDL, we want everyone to be able to do those three things and in that way, equally integrated and with substantially equivalent ease of use, meaning at the same time as everybody else and as independently as possible. So I'll wrap up here with just a couple of uh, additional big ideas. Um, this is a quote that I often share when I do presentations around accessibility. Accessibility and UDL, you can put in UDL in parentheses there, is proactive, not reactive. You can't take a regular muffin and throw a bunch of blueberries on top of it and call it a blueberry muffin. This is a quote from Cordelia McGee-Tubb, who's a web developer focusing on accessibility. 
you have to take those blueberries and you have to bake them into the batter. And you could use other metaphors, right? Other cooking metaphors out there. Um, you know, it, it, the idea here is that you have to think about accessibility from the beginning as you're considering your learning goals, right? UDL considers the learning goal, the assessment, the methods, and the materials. Well, even from the very start, when you're thinking about your learning goals, you want to make sure you consider other barriers in the goals, other barriers that are embedded. Because maybe I'm asking people to only write to demonstrate their understanding. Nothing wrong with writing, right? It just has to be one of the options. So um, starting with the goal, right? You want to make sure that you're thinking about barriers and how to address them. And then all the way through the assessment, the methods, and the materials. So we want to make sure we build in those blueberries from the start. We bake them in as opposed to adding them at the end. So we do have some resources. Um, if you go to the AIM Center, the AIM Center is one of our federally funded technical Alert assistance from centers. Tips. See what's new in Mac OS Sonoma. Ignore that. I have a screen reader running in the background and every once in a while it makes its preference, presence known. So we do have a resource on the CAS website uh, around creating accessible documents. And we use a really nice mnemonic um, slide. So we want you to slide into accessibility. So thinking about five best practices, five things you can do to get started into uh, the world of accessibility. And I'll just give you one that everybody can do right now. Whenever you create a document, if there's a built-in accessibility checker, use it. <laughs> so if I were to get the chat, the t-shirt, it would be hashtag run the checker. So whether it's your learning management system or your authoring application, most likely it has an accessibility checker now. And so make sure you use it because that can really help you identify some of these barriers that are low hanging fruit that are very easy to quickly address. And the reason why we do this, um, I emphasize when I talk about accessibility is the curb cut effect. You know, when we build curb cuts into our cities, we made them easier to navigate for people with wheelchairs. And at the same time, we made them more accessible for parents pushing strollers, for travelers pulling luggage, uh, for uh, delivery people. Your UPS person really appreciates curb cuts when they have to deliver a big order. And so that's the idea behind accessibility in the digital world as well, right? If we build in captions, it's not just people who are deaf and hard of hearing that can benefit from them. It's the person at the restaurant or at the airport where they can't listen to the content, but they can follow along with the captions. So again, equally integrated with substantial equivalent ease of use. When we create these accessible solutions, everybody can benefit. And by the way, by way of trivia, curb cuts were developed in the early 1950s in a city in Michigan called Kalamazoo, Michigan. And the reason for it is that there was a large population of veterans coming back from, I think, the Korea War. And so the city had really high curbs, and they had to find a way to make them so that the veterans could navigate it. And so they started creating the curb cuts. Uh, unfortunately, that idea kind of died down, and then it was resurrected again in the 1970s at UC Berkeley. Because, again, there were large numbers of people with disabilities there who use wheelchairs and who needed a more accessible learning environment. And now we all benefit from those innovations. Just like we all benefit from captions in Zoom, something that people with disabilities were asking for for years and then the pandemic came along and all of a sudden we're all benefiting from those uh, innovations. So I'll leave you with this quote and then a story and I'm gonna turn it over to the Echo 360 team here. Uh, David Berman is someone we work with at CAS. He's our um, accessibility consultant. And he says, uh, for the first time in history, we have the power to include everyone. Think about that. We have the tools, right? I just mentioned we have accessibility checkers now built into a lot of our learning management systems and our authoring applications. We have the laws. <laughs> we have the Americans with Disabilities Act. We have Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. We have Section 504. So what's left? 
our mindsets. If our mindsets change and we accept the idea, the premise that everybody can learn and that the barriers are not in them, but in the learning environment and how we design it and how we can co-design it and redesign it, then we can realize this vision, right? That for the first time in history, everybody can be included. So I'm gonna leave you with a story here. And again, feel free to share in the chat what resonates with you with this story. Cause this is what, what, it's, what it's all about for me with UDL. Uh, on the screen, I have an image of Dave Brubeck. This is from the 1940s. And so he's a dapperly dressed uh, white man wearing thick glasses. The thick glasses are gonna figure into the story. So Dave Brubeck was born to a family of cattle ranchers in California. And at first, he decided to follow the family business, and he went to veterinary school. But his heart really wasn't into veterinary science. Uh, his heart was in the conservatory because his mom was a piano teacher. And so they told him, your heart really is in the conservatory. Go and follow your heart and you know, learn music. Unfortunately, when he got to the conservatory, he almost flunked out. <laughs> And they actually told him, we're going to pass you, but on one condition. And the one condition is that you never teach anybody piano. And the reason why Dave Brubeck struggled in his music classes is because, I mentioned that the glasses were going to come into the story here. Uh, he has a significant or had a significant visual impairment. And even though his mom was a piano teacher, he never learned how to read music by sight. He never learned how to sight read music. Now let's fast forward a little bit. And Dave Brubeck releases Time Out. And it becomes the best-selling jazz album of all time. So remember, you should never teach piano. But he comes up with an album that becomes the best-selling jazz album of all time. And has all these intricate time signatures in this album. But you should never teach piano. Here's what President Obama said when Dave Brubeck was inducted into uh, the uh, Kennedy Center Honors. You can't understand America without understanding jazz. And you can't understand jazz without understanding Dave Brubeck. Shouldn't teach piano. You're inducted into the Kennedy Center Honors. Here's another person who shouldn't teach piano or anything about music because he never learned how to read music. Michael Jackson, he couldn't, most of his compositions were done by him beatboxing into a recording device and then having other people kind of take it the rest of the, of the way, people like Quincy Jones. And so you've probably heard of a little album called Thriller, right? Best-selling pop music album of all time, right? Again, the reason why I do UDL is because there's on tap genius. And we never know, the person in the back of the room could be the next Albert Einstein, could be the next Albert um, Steve Jobs, but we may not know that, right? Because we may be designing environments where that genius is not realized. We haven't con con you know, created the conditions for them to really blossom and share their knowledge and their understanding. So that's my goal when I'm building learning environments based on universal design for learning is that we tap a person's full potential. For me, I'll just share this. I am uh, visually impaired significantly so. I do photography as a hobby, right? Perfect match. But how do you think I do photography? It's through accessibility, right? I do a ton of research through accessible apps, birding apps that allow me to learn the sounds of all these birds. Most of the birds I never see, I hear them. And most of the time when I take a photo, I don't even see them. I rely on my camera's autofocus system to capture that photo. So again, I'm able to do photography. I'm able to live a full life. You know, I was able to pursue my education, get to the highest levels of education because of accessibility, because of universal design for learning. So I still won't teach piano, but I do have a great appreciation from having taken a jazz class in college of the meaning of jazz and, and how it works and so on. So with that, I'm gonna open it up, see if we have a minute here before I turn it over to the ECHO team. 
But just want to hear from you. What resonated with you? What are you taking away? Uh, what will you share? What do you plan to apply to your own setting? So I know some of that was review, but hopefully you're it's helping you kind of make some connections here and how things fit together. Crickets, <laughs> I'm comfortable with crickets too. I do have sound effects here, but I don't have crickets. Uh, the first person that speaks up, uh, you might get an air horn. <laughs> So if you want me to use the sound effects. <laughs> uh, Jordan says, on tap genius gave him chills. Oh, awesome. I'm glad to hear that. Maybe you'll get a yay for that. <laughs> Let's see. Sarah, uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Some Very exciting to see someone so excited about implementing this. I'm always excited about universal design for learning. It's, it's I live and breathe it. So thank you for sharing that. You're going to get a clap. In case you're wondering, I have a soundboard here. I can tap buttons and play different sounds. So I have a question, Luis. I had to step away for a second here. So if you covered it, I, I apologize. But... Um, hey, that voice I sounds to... familiar. <laughs> uh, so the question I have is, you know, the emergence of AI and the role that AI will play in UDL. Um, of course, there's a big fear of that. And how, what do you, uh, how do you address that? Uh, because there's, um, there's so much potential in AI that can be utilized mm -hmm. um, with, with UDL. Um, and can, I think it can play a real good, a pivotal role in providing um, supports. So I'm just interested in your perspective of that. Great question, Mark. I think you get a big air horn for that one, for bringing up AI. <laughs> uh, I knew you would bring a really good question. So I think a lot of the concern about AI uh, is centers around assessment, uh, right? People feel like, oh, students are going to cheat. Not a new argument, by the way. We heard that 20, 25 years ago when search engines came out. By the way, go back. Remember, radio was going to destroy education. And then television was going to destroy education. And now, you know, you follow the trend there, right? So here's the thing. If you create an assessment, um, there's a way that you can make it AI proof. And the way you do that is by make it authentic. Remember the M&Ms? I don't know if you were around, Mark, when I mentioned the idea of bringing an M&Ms into education. Uh, by that, I mean making it meaningful, making it matter. So your assessment should have some connection to a real world problem. And whether that's using something like problem-based learning or you know, Mark and I are familiar with a concept called challenge-based learning, which is very similar, right? If you make it authentic, then then we turn to the different question of students using AI for the mechanics of it. And that's where I really see a lot of potential in making our text-to-speech work better, right? Because it has more natural sounding voices and better predictions, making our writing more efficient because we can use better autocomplete and autocorrect and so on. But we need to begin with making it something that's authentic and that has a voice, right? It has a person's voice in it. So the way that I would say, and I know we're running short on time, is learning should be personalized. Don't forget the person. There needs to be a person in the middle of all this and approach AI as a first draft. So uh, it's, it's a first draft and occasionally it hallucinates and creates things out of thin air. So it has to be approached as just a first draft. Does that help, Mark? Yes, it does. All right, well, I'll turn it over to you, Krista. Thank you so much, Luis. And actually you saying that AI hallucinates, that's like a legitimate term. I just learned that last night in AI. <laughs> My friend is writing a thesis on it, on the ethical governance of AI. So I got really excited when I recognized that term. <laughs> Thank you so much. So we are going to go ahead and move into our case presentation for today. Um, this is to help you 
take what you've learned from this series so far and actually try to brainstorm um, different strategies and resources that we could provide for students that struggle with these similar issues that you may see in this case presentation. So uh, please feel free to um, put your answers in the chat or unmute. Um, and I do wanna throw out a disclaimer that UDL is not about reducing expectations or academic rigor. It's really about providing multiple pathways to help each student meet the end goal of the course. And these cases are not meant to single anyone out. We recognize that some class policies are put in place because of personal experience and needing to protect your guys' own time. So if you do see something that reflects something that may be in your syllabus, please know that it isn't meant to single you out. We're gonna really just try to share our struggles and solutions to mitigate these issues that we know everybody is having, so. This case scenario is about John, who has a reading comprehension and disability flare-ups. John is a college student pursuing a degree in psychology, and he's passionate about his studies and is determined to succeed, but faces unique challenges due to their disability. John has a learning disability that affects their reading comprehension and processing speed, as well as a medical condition that results in unpredictable flare-ups. John is enrolled in a challenging course on cognitive psychology, which has a strict no late work policy. In this course, students are expected to submit assignments and exams on time and late submissions are penalized with a zero and there's no option to make up that assignment. So John's struggles in this scenario is processing speed. His learning disability affects his, uh, his processing speed, making it difficult for him to complete assignments as quickly as his peers and puts them at a disadvantage when trying to meet strict deadlines. Accessible materials. The course materials, such as online readings and lecture notes, aren't fully accessible to their screen reader software, making it um, hard for them to access and comprehend the content efficiently. And unpredictable, unpredictable medical issues. Um, he has a mobility issue that sometimes results in unexpected uh, medical appointments or emergencies, and this can interfere with his ability to meet deadlines. So some questions that I wanna to pose to the group, um, just to kind of recap this, the course has a no late submission policy. Uh, John's disability impacts his reading or his processing speed, and he does use a screen reader, but sometimes the content isn't accessible with his software. So reflecting on your own experiences with the different teaching methods and policies, how might a UDL focused approach have positively impacted your learning experience? And feel free to unmute, or if you can think of any strategies that may work. Um, well, for me, it's it's a little hard to take uh, take off my uh, disability services uh, hat on this one. But it's why is there? I mean, the question I would go back to is why is there uh, no late submission pro policy? Why is there a very strict deadline that this is the exact time that you're doing that? Um, and, you know, again, sometimes it's scaffolding of classes and as you're moving along and there might be reason for that, then the question I come back to then is um, if these are assignments, um, why are they not put in the syllabus at the beginning of the semester so we can front load time for a student to be able to work on a project, um, to, you know, somewhat limiting the time constraint that is placed on a student to be able to do that. So, you know, can that student get the the assignment well ahead of time? Um, so, and then of course, if not accessible from a screen reader, it's gotta be. So <laughs> you need to make it accessible. Um, and there, there's no question that why it wouldn't be. Um, and that's where there are resources usually at a university that will allow them to be able to do that. But maybe there are other ways that that information can get um, that they can get that information in. Um, something like we have uh, Ally here, so um, where it can turn it into uh, text-to-speech. Um, um, of course, it needs to be accessible in order for that to be able to happen, but there are ways that those things can happen and there are tools that will allow them to be able to do that. Well, and, and following up on what you said, Mark, first question you should always ask yourself, what is the goal? So meeting these strict deadlines, what is that preparing you for? 
is that preparing you for the world that exists or the world of the future, right? I mean, if you were getting ready to go and work at a factory where time was essential, completing these tasks at a given in a given time for your period, that's the goal, then great. But really ask that question up front, like what is the goal? And why are there these deadlines? Or is the goal to really accomplish an outcome and meet meet a specific criteria that you've set for the class? And if the student demonstrates that, that they understand that criteria, then, you know, <laughs> that, that should be the goal. Um, and this happens a lot. This is very familiar. If you have large uh, veteran populations, they often have like disabilities. They often have to miss school because they have to go to appointments and so on. So um, that's a population that's really impacted by things like this, where you have very strict policies. So kind of an interesting underlying theme from what you said, Luis, do you think attitudinal barriers really play a key part in all of this? Yes, absolutely. There is a, sort of a gatekeeping. Um, I can tell you as someone who went through a doctorate, there is like a hazing aspect to it. <laughs> like it was hard for me. It's going to be hard for you. <laughs> as opposed to like taking a different attitude, like I'm part of this uh, this group. And I want to welcome you into this group and the rights and responsibilities that come with being part of this group. So I, a lot of these things are done um, just from an end, like when we think about equity, that there are like gatekeeping roles that some of these things play. Um, you know, you're probably all familiar with the weed course. I don't know if they still use that term, but the course that everybody comes in as pre-med and then they take that one course <laughs> <laughs> and then we all, I know from going from personal experience, we all then become political science and psychology and so on majors. But that course, like, shouldn't be that way. Like, if you want to pursue a STEM career, um, we should look at, like, how do we make that course, the, inf the information, the activities more accessible so that you can make an informed decision, but it's not one that's forced upon you. So there is a lot of gatekeeping that still goes on and that has uh, implications for equity. I appreciate that follow-up example. Go ahead, Mark. Well, I think I like what Luis said a little bit earlier in here is, it, is it's a productive struggle, right? Um, so you give them the tools. So um, yes, it's going to be a struggle, but it's productive because now I have the tools, that student has the tools to be able to uh, get to the end goal, which is ultimate um, that learning piece. So, mm -hmm. I love that term. I'm gonna have to write that down. Productive struggle. I feel like that has so many applications. I'm gonna teach my seven year old that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like chemistry should be hard, <laughs> but it should be hard for the right reasons, right? Like there should be ways for you. We can make the notation, for instance, more accessible. We can represent it through 3D models. Uh, you know, there are toys out there where you can put together chemistry things uh, so that they make sense for you. So that's what's meant by productive struggle is that you're reaching for something that's beyond your current abilities, but you have the ways of getting there, right? The m, &M is embedded in it. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I do these presentations before lunch. It's bad timing. People get hungry. So I'm talking <laughs> about M and M's and muffins and omelets. Sometimes rap music. <laughs> so um, I feel like we've had a pretty good discussion, and we're kind of coming close on time. Is there any other? final thoughts or anything that you guys would like to see in the additional resources um, that maybe we can elaborate on from this session. We would love to hear your feedback and we can definitely include that. I don't know if we focused much on AI um, in our previous resources, but I think we'll maybe try to find a couple good links. Um, what was all, what was the term, Luis? Uh, hallucinations. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like I, I've been using uh, AI for my um, formatting my bibliographies, but 
Sometimes it hallucinates and it makes up authors that never existed, <laughs> books that were never published. So you need to make sure you check it. But it's really good at APA formatting, which I'm really bad at. So we we work well together, AI and I, in that sense. I do have a comment in the or a message.